Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Till All Are One, and I am very happy because I have a longtime friend of mine, someone who I've interviewed before many years ago when we talked about Transformers autocracy and things on my old podcast with my friend Gene Hoyle called Nerd Nation Radio, and now all the stuff he's done with Transformers and now launching his own creator and book called The Kill Lock, Livio Ramadelli, thanks so much for being here today, man. Thank you for having me, man. Looking forward to it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and where can people find you on social media if they want to check out your stuff? Yeah, so Twitter and Instagram, it's the same handle, just uh, my full name, Levi Ramadelli. Awesome. And I'll have that on the screen, guys. So while you're you know listening to this, you'll be able to see that uh, address right there. And then the link to it will be in the description box. So you're one click away. Make sure you make a new friend, follow Livio, or Livio, and make sure you check out all of his amazing artwork because he's got some really great stuff. Now, you before we dive full into this, because we were just saying it right before we started recording, you've been working on Transformers for about 10 plus years now. Yeah, yeah, it's been a long time, yeah. And uh, and we were saying how it's funny sometimes, uh, you know, in career paths, in comics, sometimes you will start off, you know, if, you know, with, especially with your talent, you know, you go in there and you're working on Transformers, and now after 10 plus years of Transformers, you're finally doing your own creator own work. And I just want to know before we get into that in a little bit, how does that feel to finally have Kill Lock out there? It feels amazing. You know, I think um, I'd always been interested in storytelling and I was drawing my own, you know, comics and characters since I was a kid. And, you know, to finally be able to do it with the skills and stuff you've learned as an adult, you know, to really try and make a sincere effort at it. Um, it's been great. It's been, you know, several years of sort of working on it quietly and then it's finally being released. And thankfully it's gotten a nice response, which, which feels great, you know, so it's it's very rewarding. Awesome. And if you guys haven't checked it out yet, before we get into interview, please Go find the issues, The Kill Lock. It's by IDW, uh, written and drawn by Livio here, who is, I mean, and it's easy to say the word, oh, you're so talented, but I know why in saying that, you're really saying, wow, you work so hard to achieve this stuff. And because what you do is not easy. Um, and uh, and I got to say, seeing you grow all these years, it's been a tremendous thrill to watch as a friend and a fan of yours. And you guys out there, please pick up Kill Lock. Issue 6, I think, comes out the last week of July, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I think it's the 29th. Awesome. Yeah. And then the trade paperback will be coming out soon after, correct? Yeah, the trade will be out in October. It'll collect everything. Uh, the Killer has some great like pinup art by other artists in it, and it's got psychological profiles by Dr. Dre Letamendi that cover the main cast. There's some really cool bonus features, and all that stuff will be in the trade as well as some new pages too. Awesome. So look at that. Go buy all the single issues now. Get issue six when it comes out, and then the trade in October. Treat yourself, everybody. Um, so, all right, so we have, uh, my first question, obviously, it's, I start this place with most people who come on the show, which is kind of your origin story. What shows or comics were among your first when you decided to, you know, that you were like, hey, you know what, I might pursue this as a career, doing artwork? I mean, I think growing up, I, I was a child of the 80s, so Star Wars, Transformers, Ninja Turtles, <laughs> that that stuff was kind of my, my jam. Um, pretty The pretty basic stuff that everyone was really into back then. Uh, I had always hoped I would be able to do something professionally with it. I think especially something in science fiction like Star Wars and Transformers was always my, my favorite. Um, I, I don't know when, I think, you know, I went from like watching the Ninja Turtles cartoon to seeing the comics, seeing how like adult and brutal the comics were compared to the show. And that made me think more about like, oh, comics is like a profession. Like you could do more, you could do a longer run of something, you know. Uh, I, I don't know if I ever had like one day where I decided to do it, but it was always it was always my dream for sure. Nice, awesome. Yeah, I mean, yeah, sometimes it is. It's like a, for me, it was a switch. Like when I saw The Crow in the theaters, I turned to my mom and said, I want to work in movies. And she was just like, okay, just like that? <laughs> <laughs> nice, that's so, great. You know, but, uh, but so it's, like, yeah, it, that, it happens like that. So, uh, you, you know, you spending that time uh, owning it, you know, and like, and working on your craft and, and working on the artwork, that led you to some really great schools. And I love shouting out teachers because to me, that's another very tough profession. I was a substitute teacher before, and I've had a lot of great teachers inspire me to do uh, things over the years. So, you know, for you, graduating from Penn State and then also going to the Academy of Art in San Francisco, did you have any professors that really opened your eyes to the way you look at art and maybe helped you create art in a way? Yeah, I did. Um, I think so. Penn State was more of a sort of fine art mindset. It was kind of drawing still lifes and that kind of thing, models, which I, I got a lot out of. But I think grad school was really my my area. Like I really felt at home there. Um, grad school was amazing for me at the Academy of Art because our teachers were a lot of them were working professionals. Like literally, like I had a teacher who was amazing named Tony Kristoff, where he was an art director at Pixar. 
And so he would, it was a night class. So he would literally go work at the time on like Wally and then come home, come to teach us that night. And it was amazing. It was like, here's what we did at Pixar today. Like that was a really invaluable, really invaluable teacher. Cause it was like, you know, it was not only the skills, but it was like how the business works and, and like the stakes of a, a you know, project of that size. It was really eye opening. I got a lot out of that class. I also had a, a watercolor teacher named Steven player. Who's like a phenomenal artist. And he taught me so much about color and, you know, just being a freelance illustrator and that kind of lifestyle. So those are two guys that I really owe a lot to. That's awesome. I mean, yeah, it, that's so invaluable because there's so many people like, you know, when, when I was working in comics and even in movies too, there were, when I went into both those professions, I knew a lot about how the business worked before going in. Um, yeah. But I meet a lot of people who don't. And that is something that I loved sharing with people was like opening their eyes to that. So having that from a teacher is amazing. But then also I got to say your teacher who taught you colors. Wow. Talk about you know, praising that guy because uh, your work with color, especially on your artwork, is some of my favorite. Like when I see. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. For those listening, I'm going to gush all over, you know, leave you here for the, the whole interview. But yeah, those some of your colors and the and sometimes your use of shades of colors and lack of colors sometimes really help your art pop. So, yeah, it's clear you had good teachers, man, for sure. Oh, thanks. No, I really appreciate that. Yeah. And I think it's like and it's a constant evolution, too, you know, like you you go to school and then you start working professionally after that and you're still learning all the time you know it's not like you emerge from school like fully finished <laughs> you know you're, you're still every profession i think you just keep learning through your whole life you know yeah i think i, I can't remember if it was bruce lee but it was like this there's this great saying that um someone once told me when i was younger bruce lee didn't tell me directly but i was like i remember hearing it when i was younger which was uh never stop being a student um, yeah, and uh, and I and I've taken that to heart. I always am open to learn new things, and that's that's really great. And you're right, you, yeah. Just because you finish school, it's not you're not like, all right, I'm the king of the jungle now. It's like, nope. <laughs> now now you go to a new jungle and you start over. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, absolutely, man. That's so true. Yeah. So you started yeah. off doing cover work for various graphic novels, and then, like I said, landed interiors on Transformer Comics at IDW. How did you end up working from them and being on such a high profile book? You know, coming out of school and stuff. So I was really, really fortunate. I had two really lucky things happen to me. Um, as I was finishing school, I was looking for a job, and I had gone to grad school kind of studying concept art and illustration. I thought, you know, for job security, I would maybe try and get a job in-house at, like, a video game or a movie company doing concept art, then I could do comics on the side. I didn't know if I could, you know, make a living doing comics straight out of school. And really randomly, Wildstorm, which was Jim Lee's company at the time, uh, they posted that they were looking for a concept artist to work on the DC Universe video game. And I applied, got hired, which is very ironic because Jim was like one of my heroes growing up. And the fact that like I was checking that blog for fun, I was not checking it to look for a job, <laughs> was hilarious. Um, so that led me to doing comic conventions, which is like setting up an artist alley and that, that whole world. And um, like that's where I met one day just randomly, uh, Chris Ryle, who was editor in chief at IDW, walks by and saw you know my samples I had some transformers kind of fan art and he was like oh you should submit to us and so i submitted and i got hired to do covers like right after that which was incredible like uh, i thought you know i would I, if i only got to do one transformers cover i would have been thrilled with that i didn't know it would lead to 10 years of work so <laughs> well so that's been yeah yeah i'm glad it did because uh you're, you're to me when i look back at because I, I bought them all i mean i bought everything from idw like i before that i had the dreamwave stuff for transformers and before that the marvel stuff and um you know generation one and two so i i i've been following transformers forever and when i think back on the last 10 years of these characters i i really i mean there's alex milney there's all these other great art, artists that have popped up men and women who do great things but honestly man you're to me the quintessential guy like, oh, thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. no problem, man. So I'm, I'm glad. I mean, I'm glad that worked out. And yeah, that game, actually, that game's amazing. That DC Universe game, I remember when that came yeah. out. Um, yeah. That's cool. And, and working with Jim Lee, like Jim is a hero of mine, too. Oh, yeah. No, he was, he was incredible. And like to have him be like my first boss was very surreal because I never even got to meet Jim before that, like at a Comic-Con. Yeah. And yeah, it's very, very funny. But yeah, that, I learned a lot on the game, too, because I was working with a lot of like really experienced really good artists and i was kind of the new one of the two new people that got hired for that so yeah it was pretty crazy that's amazing yeah no that's great yeah. um and that just shows how how great your stuff was at that time and you know like you said you keep you know it's an evolution you keep just getting better and better um and i and that's when i you know you really stood out to me because i i'm sure i have seen your stuff 
pre-aneurysm, but unfortunately most of my life I remember post-aneurysm. So I, yeah. I came across your stuff around the autocracy days uh, and, you know, with Flint Dilly and Chris Metzen. And yep. I really loved seeing your stuff there. And that led me to go, oh, what have I been missing at IDW these past couple of years? And I went back and started buying stuff. And, uh, you know, and obviously Chris, uh, Flint, uh, Flint uh, you know, is a, a writer from the original Transformers animated series and then the movie as well. And Chris Metzen, who's phenomenal, has done a lot of great stuff working in video games and comic books. So how did the project of Autocracy come with the three of you coming together? Yeah, so that was that was an amazing project. Um, I had done a couple issues of Transformers, and then IDW said we have this autocracy series that's going to be kind of the origin of Optimus Prime, and you know the the falling out between him and Megatron, and it's going to be Flint Dilly and Chris Metzen, which is amazing. I was like, <laughs> holy shit! Like, of course I'll do this project, and and those guys were amazing because they they again were like very experienced, and they really treated me like an equal on it. You know, like I. I loved every minute of that project. I mean, so much. That's why we did two sequels to it because we just enjoyed it so much, you know? And yeah, it was just a blast, man. I mean, it was just like, I remember we would go to Chris Metzen's office. He's a, one of the architects of Blizzard. Right. We'd go to his office and me and Flint and him would just kick around ideas. And it was just a, a blast. I mean, they, those, those guys are both so just fun to be around and really good writers too. So it was just, I was, I was very happy to be on that project. Yeah, and I I love both those guys, and I've run into him a couple times since. If Flint actually remembers me when I see oh, him, nice. Cause he's that's great. Just, yeah, he's just like, oh yeah, hey, what's up, man? Like he he's like immediately before I even greet my you know introduce myself, and he's like, uh, what did you bring me to sign today? Because <laughs> I have every version of Autocracy. I have the print version, uh, the digital version, um, or the print uh, graphic novel, obviously, the digital version. I have the hardcover with all three books in it. I have the motion comic version. Uh, oh, like, nice. Like, I own every version of that story, and well, also... Thank you. Yeah, of course, and also Monstrosity and Primacy, and you guys have all signed every version I have, which is really nice of you guys, um, but seeing that collaboration is great, because collaboration to me is such a major component in making most things, especially comic books, and you definitely work with some of the most creative people, as you just said, you know, Flint and Chris. So um, what were some of the best things about collaborating with those two and what did you learn from them that carries now into your current work? Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot. I think the way that they sort of broke stories and the way they talk about characters. So for Autocracy, when I got on there, they had already roughly had the first series mapped out, you know. Mm-hmm. But Monstrosity and Primacy, we, we made that up as, like, when when I when we finished Autocracy, we wanted to do more. So I was there from the very beginning on those. And it was just like the way that they talk about character, and then they would cite things in movies that I hadn't heard of, which is really interesting because, like, you, you know, they would cite, like, a... There's a movie called The Men Who Would Be King with mm-hmm. Michael Caine and uh, I and Sean Connery. I had not seen that movie, but that was one that Flint really likes. And they would cite that as I think we were using that on Monstrosity. And it's like it's pretty interesting because at the time, the notion of taking something so different and you and applying it to a Transformers story. Like I studied storytelling, and I was I, I was aware of that. You know, you pull influences from everywhere, but it was cool to see them pull on things that I'd never that I wasn't familiar with. You know. Like they would cite Dirty Harry in a reference to something. And it, just, it, was, it was really interesting. So, um, so I, I've kind of continued to try and learn and study that as well. Well, I, I got to say, and we'll, we'll talk about Kill Lock here in a minute. We'll get there. But I, I, I want to say regarding that, it, it's, to me, it's a, it's a smart tactic because you're dealing with giant robots. To add some humanity to them or some familiarity to them, it's great to quote, you know, to pull from movies that whether we've seen them or not that do exist because it adds that level of uh, understanding of their motivations and their reactions. And I think you've carried that really well in the Kill Lock, where you've added a lot of humanity to the robots in that story too. Um, Thank you. Thank you. That was something I was really conscious about was to make them as human as possible. Like I think the kill luck I think is always sort of read better than it is as a pitch. You know, Mm -hmm. I think when you, when you hear the concept, it's kind of, it's kind of out there. Uh, but I think when you read it, it, it should feel much more human. Like, you know, they're, they're characters talking. They just have to be robots. That was my, my, my goal was to make it feel like very like uh, approachable with relatable sort of personalities in there. Well, you, you nailed it. And like I said, well, Thanks. yeah. Um, but so like you being, uh, you know, you talked about being an artist alley and, and things like that. That's, you know, one place I remember one year when I got to sign an artist alley, they were like, Hey, 
you know, where would you like to be positioned? And I said, oh, I get a choice. And they're like, well, not always, but we'll try our best. And I, I, the first thing I did was I looked for your name. And I said, I want to be near Livio Ramondelli. Oh, nice. I, and they, they were like, okay. And I think that year we actually sat right next to each other. Um, we did. I remember that year, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. I, at San Diego. And I was like, this was the coolest thing. And the, so, you know, you being a convention guy, and, you know, because to me, that I, I kind of equate that. Like, I grew up listening to music, and I, I equate going to conventions as almost like doing a road tour for your band. Um, oh, totally, yeah. Yeah, and so, you know, and I ran into you so many times that, you know, whether it's New York or San Diego or, you know, different conventions around the, the United States. So from bot cons to comic cons to fan experiences at Universal, which I ran into you there one time, um, what are some of your favorite elements about comic conventions? Yeah, I agree. Like, I think, first of all, it was really nice to sit next to you because Comic Con's a long, you know, four and a half days that if you're <laughs> next to someone you don't like, it's really hard. So it's really nice to be next to someone who's, who's cool. Um, yeah, I think, like, it's really cool to meet people. You know, you meet opportunities professionally, you know, random editors walk up. You also meet friends, you know, both new and old. Um, I, it allowed me to travel the world, which I never thought drawing for a living would let me do that. You know, I've been to Comic Cons and, you know, Tokyo, Beijing, Dubai, like I never, never thought I would get to see the world that way because of drawing, especially drawing robots. But, um, but it's been a blast, you know, it's been one of the most rewarding things of my life is kind of going to other countries and meeting the readers over there. And yeah, it's, I really like it a lot. That's amazing. Yeah. I never forget the first time I saw you post pictures of like Dubai and Tokyo and like, and these are all places I would, I would love to go. Like I, my, unfortunately my health per, per, Pre, you know, prevents me from going, but it's so great to see friends who experience this. And like, and like you said, you're like, you know, never, maybe never in your life you thought, oh, I'm going to be drawing Transformers, but that's going to lead me. That just shows one, I think, how great your art is and how how much hard work you put into it to make it great. But also too, the 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 love that Transformers has worldwide. I mean, it it's really is well received all around the world. Yeah, it absolutely is. Like, I that, that's one thing we talk about with um, some of the other artists that work on the book is that, you know, Spider Man and X Men and all that stuff is very popular as well. But it really, you don't have like specific Spider Man conventions in other countries, you know. Whereas Transformers has has those. There's regular Transformers conventions in tons of countries, and that the community is is amazing. You know, I think in a way that it. it sort of I was stunned at like how kind of worldwide the audience was like I knew it was popular in like Japan and China but you know there's there's one in the UK every year that's really really popular and it's it's been a blast and those people generally are they're all great like sometimes the smaller conventions can be more fun in a way too because the social aspect is great where you work the show and then everyone tends to be at the same hotels and bars and you get to just connect with your, your type of people that you kind of wish you met earlier in life you know Absolutely. I mean, I always say, like, I love going to San Diego Comic Con. I love New York Comic Con. But when I go to a bot con, because it's specific on one thing, I know that everybody there is just like me. Absolutely. Yeah. It's definitely like, you know, Comic Con, like New York and San Diego, they're they're so big and interests are so varied that it's not really your community. Like, it's your community is in there, but it's it's just such a gigantic production. But a BotCon, it's pretty much every single person there you can talk to. You can walk up to a stranger and strike up a conversation. It's it's a really great feeling. I, I absolutely agree. Um, and so one last question before we get into Kill Lock is uh, I do want to mention, because I had Tyler uh, Blazinski on recently, who was your uh, co-storyteller on Transformers Galaxies 1 through 4, which just recently came out. And I highly recommend everyone go check him out and also go listen to my interview with Tyler because it was a a blast talking to him. Uh, so working with legends in the industry uh, and also first timers, this was Tyler's first comic. Uh, but yeah. I, I for one couldn't tell because I love the book that much. So, you know, what drew you to drawing this story or what opportunities does working with a first time comic writer offer compared to a veteran writer? That's a great question. Uh, I think with, with this particular story, Tyler was so passionate about, you know, the Constructicons. They were his sort of favorite characters. And, and his story was such a great idea. Like the notion that these hardworking construction robots built a beautiful city that they're not allowed to live in. You know, and the notion of one of our first visual ideas was them on this kind of dirty moon and they're just staring back at this glinting Cybertron in the sky of like this paradise that they built that they can't live on. I just thought that was such a great concept. It made them really relatable from like the first page, you know, and, and Tyler was just a really, another really great collaborator, like Chris and Flint, like 
he was new to comics so the only challenges there are really just you know formatting like it's right. it's you know i would move things around and he was also always very easy to work with very 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 cool like you just kind of like move panels or you put something on another page because you just know visually how it's going to play out more but but he yeah he, he had very natural instincts for it too like his i thought his cliffhangers every issue were great you know i thought he he managed to give the constructicons personalities that were very distinct which they haven't always had they were sort of a a group i didn't get to do much with too in my uh, my first run on like the a first idw continuity but devastator was like one of my favorite characters so it was really cool to finally do a big story with with those characters yeah and i gotta say i was telling him how much i connected with that story because me my whole life has been divided into two things i'm, I'm either following my in my grandfather and my mom's footsteps and i do a lot of nine to five hard labor stuff so i'll like you know i worked in construction before landscaping um so i very much had that kind of job that most people kind of look down at sometimes and then i've had the creative jobs where people are like oh you got the dream job you know and so seeing that blend with those characters i never would have dreamed of that kind of approach to them in the past and i gotta say you and tyler yeah you guys knocked it out of the park both visually and story-wise that those four issues out of the new continuity are easily my favorite four issues of any of it so far thank you no i really appreciate it i mean they were definitely made with love you know because i i had done so much transformers too and i was really i was working on the kill lock i was deep into that at the time so when they came into me about doing more transformers i didn't necessarily know if i wanted to do that um because we'd also like we'd relaunch the continuity there was new creators on board and i was like oh maybe we should let them have you know their shot but it was time but tyler was a new creator you know and he requested specifically if he could work with me on this one and and then his story was just so good that I was like, sure, like I, if he wants me to do this, I'm, I'm down. So <laughs> you're like, wait, yeah. he wants to work with me, and it's Devastator. I'm in. <laughs> yeah, it was just well, it was, it's so fun because it's like there are times in the past where it's just the nature of comics that you get scripts where there's things you just don't particularly want to draw, you yeah. know, and it can be it can be kind of tiring if you're if you're working on stuff that you're not that interested in. But with Tyler, it's like every scene in all those four issues was really cool, and it was a lot of fun to work on. Awesome. Yeah, no, I'm so, glad. So everyone, yeah, go please go pick that book up. It's so awesome. Uh, and it'll be coming out in a hardcover very soon, too. Uh, it'll be uh, Transformers Volume 2. It'll be out in a hardcover. Um, nice. So main event time, Kill Lock. Uh, so yes. like we said, this is your first creator book published by IDW. It's available in stores now, the first five issues. Issue 6 comes out July 29th, uh, which is coming up very soon. And uh, this, you write, you draw it, you've, you're building your own world. After all these years working on Transformers, working on other people's projects, collaborating in that way, now you're in the driver's seat pretty much for like full force with you. What's it like to create something of your own, and how did the concept of Kill Lock come about? Yeah, it was like, uh, so the initial idea I had probably like, man, like six years ago, probably at this point, of, you know, pairing, I knew I wanted to do a science fiction story with the robots that I could have total freedom over, that, you know, I could kill characters, I could make them offensive, I could do whatever I wanted. Um, and I was fascinated by this idea of characters that really would never and should never mingle with each other, being forced to protect each other to survive. So very early on, I had this idea of, you know, if you had this kind of psychopath, paired with a very moral soldier and then an addict and then a kid you know what would their dynamic be like because characters that really should not be in the same room together let alone you know how to protect each other to survive so that was very appealing to me that idea i like the idea too of it being sort of a death penalty sentence that it shows that this society is kind of grinding its citizens down and what what it is doing to their culture uh, the feeling of making it was a blast. I worked on it for, you know, God, like three or four years quietly, you know, around my other stuff. Because when you're working on something like this, like you're not getting paid for it yet. So it's, you can really just, you, you do your day job work and then at night you kind of find the time or on weekends. And that's why it took longer. But but the reward at the end has been fantastic. Like I, I'm really thankful that it's gotten a nice response and people seem to be, to be liking it. Um, seeing fan art for it's been incredible because that really meant a lot to me when i was younger is doing fan art to characters that resonated with me and being on the other side of that now is just it's a blast so it's it's only been one of the best things in my life really is like making this project and having it pretty well received it really is i mean the premise is really cool like you said it's it's you have the wraith who is kind of this uh, loyal warrior maybe loyal to a fault um you have this guy the artisan who's uh, a psychopath like you said he's a basically a robot serial killer 
Um, yeah. He had, then you have this uh, a seemingly innocent kid, and you have a laborer who uh, gets drunk and, and screwed up his job, and they all get put in this death penalty sentence that no one has survived from so far, where the four of them are linked together with a kill lock. So if one of them dies, they all die. And at, really, at any point, any of them could be the cause of all four of their deaths. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's really great. So it's basically four wild cards uh, in on a team book, you know, <laughs> which is really cool. Yeah. Um, and I like, and, and I was really conscious of like the you know pitting their differences against one another, where the the very moral soldier is also the largest and stands out the most. You know, the psychopath is the smartest one. Yeah. I wanted it to really kind of be, you know, the kid, the most innocent one, is also the most physically vulnerable. I wanted it to be, you know, they all have their strengths and weaknesses kind of clashing together. And yeah, and that was the, the genesis of the idea. Awesome. Yeah, and I've already rever- reviewed the f- the first two issues. My episodes went up already, um, but my review for three and four will probably be up by the time this interview goes up. So if you guys haven't checked that out, please go check it out so you can see the reviews for the first four issues. But I'm going to save my reviews for five and six until when the trade comes out, so that way you guys go read five and six, and I won't spoil anything for you, and we'll talk about it when the trade comes out. Um, but each of these four characters, like you said, they have distinct personalities. They play really well off each other. So being the writer and artist... Uh, what is that process like, uh, you know, differing from previous processes where you're working with someone else? Like, what's the collaboration when you're collaborating with yourself? What's that like? It's, it's, it was been, it's been very cool. I mean, I think the, the biggest hurdle I found is that just fitting in, you know, as much stuff as you can into 22 pages where there's ideas, like there's always stuff that gets cut that right. you just don't have time to do. And that's been the biggest like challenge is just kind of you know fitting everything in. There was uh, issue five is the longest of the series because I basically was like, you know what, I really want this fight scene to deliver, so I added extra pages to that issue. And that's that's so that one's longer. Um, that's been the biggest challenge I would say is just kind of the the artist and the writer sort of working to fit everything they both want to see because you know as an artist you kind of want a giant money shot action scene but as a writer you're kind of like well i want also these character moments to fill out the issue too so that there's a bit of a back and forth on that but i really i really enjoyed it i mean the the good thing about like writing and drawing is you really are you're only putting in things that you kind of want to do you know there's no no one's telling you you have to have this character this scene unless you want to well that that's true absolutely so yeah yeah there's no uh Maybe there may be some internal debate but it's not like a a, a full long-winded back and forth you at at some point you're just going to go yeah okay I'll put it in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and there, it's funny too because there's there was locations that shifted a little bit. Like as I was deeper into the series, I was like, oh, maybe it should look like this. And you're like, huh, that'll look better, and it will save me time because I thought it was going to be a pain to draw this other thing. So yeah, yeah. So those are like there's a lot of happy accidents like that. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, I remember when the book starts. It's so amazing because it's like the art. It's like the artisan walking through the snow. So the contrast of like a dark robot and this beautiful like hoth like planet is uh just wonderful it's like it's rig- oh, really, yeah it's really great contrast and i've seen you do contrast like that with your other stuff because like you said you draw star wars stuff your prints and stuff like all your work is fantastic i even i'm um, actually while we're talking i'm staring at an apocalypse drawing that you did for me um it's hanging on my wall um and i also have the picture of my dog that you drew you made him a, a auto oh dog. yeah i remember that yeah <laughs> <laughs> um nice so what yeah your schedule is an intense one because i remember when this book was announced the first thought in my head, because I, you know, I, I try to keep up with you. Like you're one of the few artists that I, I actively go, oh, what's he up to? What conventions he at? How's he doing? And I'll, I'll go. To, I went to your page, and you were like, oh, Killlock's coming out. And I remember going, when did he have time to do this? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's why. Like, I worked on it quietly for years now because I was one. I mean, I think if you announce I'm doing a creator own book, and then it's, you know, there's some delay. It can, it can hurt the momentum of it and so i was like okay i'm just gonna chip away at this quietly i'll announce it you know basically when it's done when it's ready to go and and that's been really rewarding too because i think like you know when you sit down and commit to something like this too there's no guarantee it's gonna get published when you start working on it like so i mean the fact that idw gave it a green light was fantastic so yeah but i mean it's definitely uh, it's 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 been a blast though like truly feels worthwhile because you know sometimes during it you're like is anyone gonna like this story or these characters but to have it come out and people seem to like it has been has been really a blast. It's been great seeing that. And like even as a fan of yours and as a friend of yours, seeing people post their fan art and then you seeing you include pinups in the back of the each issue, it's it really is awesome, man. I'm I'm so proud of you. And uh, you know, with with the final issue coming up, what do you hope 
kind of fans you know take away from the series do you hope uh, what do you hope sticks with them the most as regarding like you know the book in general yeah um well i think like so when it was initially coming out i was like man i hope people like it and then thankfully it's gotten a pretty decent response so now i'm hoping they like the ending you know there's always <laughs> something to be worried about so you know like i, I think with the, the artist and character is an interesting one because i think he divides people that some people love that like that that personality he has and other people are like i can't wait for him to see like i can't wait for him to get what he deserves so you're like oh man you know only one of those camps might be happy at the end so we will you know we will see so i I really just hope that the ending delivers i hope it has you know the emotion and the humor that people have come to expect from the series and that once it's finished that it'll it'll go down to something people really enjoy to to see awesome man and uh and you know i I hope, and I'm sure this is the case, that this is just the beginning. I would love to see more creator stuff from you, and I, I'm sure a lot of other people would too, and I hope IDW and everyone else you work with uh, does as well because you have consistently for the past 10 years uh, not only been a good friend but just an amazing, uh, hardworking person that I, I very much look up to in this industry. And, uh, oh, thank you, man. No, you've been you've been fantastic. It's been really great to know you over the years. I really appreciate it. Yeah, and and actually, you were so great. You even did a cover for my Soul Star comic book. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. which which was awesome. So I mean, I, I'll never forget. Like I, you know, you're just one of those people that I'll always hold close to me, man. And I and I always hope to see you keep growing. So please keep doing that. And everyone out there, please go check out Levio stuff. Follow him on social media. Uh, like you said, his name is in the on the screen there, so you can see it for yourself. The link is down in the description box below. Uh, pick up Kill Lock issue six coming up July 29th. Uh, the trade paperback soon after in October. Please, everyone, support this man's work. Go go find issues that he's worked on and follow him and become a fan like me. Thank you so much, man. It's really been a pleasure, and thank you for years of friendship. I really appreciate it. Oh, I'm looking forward to many more, man. And uh, yeah. <laughs> everyone out there, thanks so much for listening to the show. As always, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff, and uh, transform and roll out. Stop! Stop! Uh, I am Bumblebee, your oldest friend, Optimus. I would lay down my life for you.